Since the dawn of civilization, spies of every nation and culture have worked to infiltrate their adversaries and glean the information that will give their side the advantage. The stakes are sky high, the strategies varied and imaginative, and the ultimate sign of success is that no one ever even knew you were there. In each episode, we will explore the moral and ethical gray zones of espionage, where treachery and betrayal go hand in hand with cunning and courage. This is the Spycraft 101 podcast. Welcome to your clandestine classroom. This is episode number four of the Spycraft 101 podcast. Joining me today is Dr. John Lyle, author of the upcoming book, The Dirty Tricks Department. He's here to talk about some of the incredible weapons and devices and plots that were developed by the Office of Strategic Services during World War II. The OSS was an intelligence agency created in 1942, which predates the Central Intelligence Agency and was staffed by some of the most brilliant and courageous Americans who ever lived, in my opinion. Their exploits and their accomplishments are the stuff of legend, and I'm really excited to learn more about them from Dr. Lyle today. Dr. Lyle, thank you for joining me today. I was really happy to hear about your upcoming book just a few weeks ago. I'm looking forward to really reading it as soon as it's published, since I haven't had the chance to look at it yet, of course. Can you tell me a little bit about your background and what it is that led you to write about the OSS? Absolutely. And, you know, thanks for having me. I've been looking at your posts online and have really enjoyed the content that you're putting out. So thank you for that. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'm doing my best to bring this history to a new generation for sure. Definitely. A little bit about my background. I, I went to Texas A&M for my undergrad in history. And then I did my PhD at the University of Texas there in Austin. And my dissertation really focused, it, it, it was on science and espionage. And so I was really looking at the Cold War. I was looking at how the CIA and the State Department tried to deploy scientists, American scientists abroad during the Cold War and kind of use them to gather intelligence. But it was through that, that I got interested in scientists within the intelligence community. And it's through that, that I kind of came across names like Stanley Lovell, one of the main guys who's involved in this OSS research and development branch that I talk about. So it's really through my dissertation that I came to this topic, that I learned about these people. And I kind of have to admit, the University of Texas was kind of paying for me to take a couple of research trips to research my dissertation, go to various archives, look at documents. And while I was at those archives, I figured I should just double dip. And you know, while I'm here, I'm gonna try to look at some of the records from this OSS R&D branch and from Stanley Level and see what I can find. So thank you to the U University of Texas for unwittingly sponsoring some of the research for this book. But that's how I kind of came to this topic. Great, that's a great opportunity. I'm glad to hear that. I'm a little bit familiar with UT Dallas already because I have been in their, their digital archive already quite a few times regarding uh, civil air transport and Air America. And I wasn't really aware that they had a lot else, but I'll have to definitely take a look after this as well. So is there a, a big focus at the at UT on a lot more espionage history besides Air America and civil air transport, to your knowledge? Well, I don't know so much at UT. Mainly what they were providing for me to do was to travel just around the country to different archives. So, you know, they would pay for my travel to go to the university or to go to like the National Archives and College Park in Maryland, the Library of Congress and other places. So and that's where most of their support was what it was doing for me is allowing me to go elsewhere. But they do. It's interesting you mentioned that, though, because as I was, oh, okay. you know, doing some research for this book, I did realize that one of the big programs that the R&D branch did, it's kind of a popular weapon, I guess. It's mainly because it's so kind of outlandish is called a bat bomb. This R&D branch was experimenting with ways to strap bombs, incendiary bombs to bats. And the idea was to re release them over Japan and they would roost in houses and there's a lot of wooden, wooden buildings in Japan, so they would start a lot of fires. But it turns out the papers for the bat bomb, one of the guys who was involved with it, a guy named Jack Kofer, they were stored at the University of Texas, which I didn't know. But as I was doing this research, I realized, wow, just right in my backyard, I have all the, you know, all the papers for this project that I'm going to be writing about. So that was useful. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's fascinating. I live in Northern Virginia myself, and I'm not far at all from the Prince William National Forest, which housed one of the OSS training camps during the war. And, you know, there's not mm -hmm. much on the ground there anymore, but it's really amazing that I can that I can walk in the footsteps of those guys, so to speak, anytime I want to. You know, I'm an hour away or less. And it's I'm continually amazed at how much of history is really all around us. The deeper you look, the the more that you'll find 
everywhere around us every day for sure. Exactly. And it makes me envious whenever I travel to Washington, D.C., especially to do research in the Library of Congress or the National Archives, because so much of this stuff happened right around there. And, and I just think, man, if I, if I lived a little bit closer, I could go to these archives all the time. I could see where these people were. Um, so, it, it, you know, it, it's great to have that history. It really is, for sure. So let's backtrack just a little bit. Can you tell me exactly what the OSS was for people who are maybe not so familiar with them already? Definitely. The OSS is kind of the precursor to the CIA. The CIA is created in 1947. So during World War II, there was the OSS instead. The OSS was kind of the spearheaded by a guy named William Donovan. He was this World War I hero. He had been shot in the leg during World War I. He had got the Medal of Honor. He was a lawyer on Wall Street and then later with the Department of Justice. And as World War II is kind of breaking out, and even a little bit before, Donovan, who knows President Franklin Roosevelt, is kind of badgering Roosevelt a little bit. Hey, I think we need to create an intelligence organization, a centralized intelligence organization that can collect information from abro abroad and have it in this centralized place, analyze the intelligence, and inform you, the president, on what's going on. We need to be informed on you know, these international affairs. We need an organization who can do that. So that's kind of the, the brief origins of the OSS. Uh, Donovan gets appointed to head the OSS after President Roosevelt creates it. First, he creates something called the Coordinator of Information, and that transforms into the OSS. So Donovan's the head of the OSS. And I guess an easy way to understand all that the OSS does is to look at the various branches. There, there are several different branches within the OSS. So there's a secret intelligence branch. And this is the branch of the OSS that sends spies abroad to report on things like troop movements. You know, where are German troops moving? What's the size of th these battalions that they have? Where are the locations of bridges and airfields and minefields and gun emplacements? These strategic things that might be useful during this war that we'll know where they are and how to target them. That's the secret intelligence branch. There's a foreign information service, this branch of the OSS that broadcasts anti-axis messages in Europe, um, kind of a battle for, for mines. There's a morale operations branch within the OSS, and this is the branch that spreads disinformation. Um, so they're dropping leaflets on German troops, trying to um, uh, decrease their morale. One of the funniest kind of operations that this morale operations branch engages in is called the German League of Lonely Women. And the idea behind this was to drop leaflets on German troops. And these leaflets would basically say, you know, there's a league of lonely German women. And since you're a patriotic German soldier, you can tell them that you've heard of this league and they will basically have sex with you. And that sounds like a, a strange thing to want to tell German troops. Why would you want them to be encouraged oh to have sex with the German women? What's, what's the big deal about that? But what morale operations was thinking is that if you can convince these German troops that the, the women who are a part of these league are patriotic German women who think they're doing their duty by, you know, having sex with these German soldiers, then these German troops are going to start thinking, well, who are these women? Maybe it's my girlfriend. Maybe it's my wife. Maybe it's, you know, who, someone, someone close to me. And so it's going to get them discouraged because they're going to think, oh my gosh, my wife is cheating on me because she thinks that's her patriotic duty to join this league. And, you know, so that was the idea, at least behind it, is to, <laughs> to uh, limit morale by, by creating this league. So that's the morale operations branch, the disinformation. There's a, a, a couple other branches within the OSS. The research and uh, analysis branch is basically there to evaluate the flood of information that's pouring in from abroad, evaluate the intelligence. They make maps and studies related to the war. And then lastly, the branch that I focus on in my book is the research and development branch. And this is headed by a guy named Stanley Lovell, a chemist from Boston. And this branch is really in charge of creating what were kind of called the dirty tricks of World War II. The secret weapons, the special weapons, all that interesting stuff, which I'm sure we'll get into in a little bit. Absolutely. From what I understand, Stanley Lovell, he was quite a character. He was a real eccentric guy in his own right, wasn't he? Definitely. He was, he was very cunning. He, he was eccentric. He was known to exaggerate quite a bit. He loved telling a good story. So that comes through in his memoir, especially. So part of the, you know, the tricky part of kind of navigating through this book is also trying to determine what is exaggeration? What's true? And fortunately, I found a lot of great 
material in the archives that actually corroborates a lot of the stuff that Stanley Lovell says. So it's been really exciting. But yeah, Stanley Lovell is this chemist from Boston. He was kind of orphaned at a young age. His parents both died when he was very young. He had an older sister who looked after him through high school. He went to Cornell for college in chemistry. And once he came out of college, he worked in a shoe and leather factory just as an ordinary chemist, this unassuming chemist. And then as World War II comes around, he gets recruited basically to become an aide of a man named Vannevar Bush. And Vannevar Bush was really the head of coordinating scientific research and development during World War II. He's, Vannevar Bush is kind of Franklin Roosevelt's unofficial science advisor. So Lovell becomes the aide to Vannevar Bush and Vannevar Bush tells Donovan basically, hey, I have this guy underneath me, Lovell. I think he might go well in your organization. So William Donovan, that head of the OSS, he eventually recruits Stanley Lovell to become what he calls his Professor Moriarty. That's the antagonist in the Sherlock Holmes books. So he wants he wants Lovell to be the guy who makes these dirty tricks. Right, right. So it sounds like you certainly found the right guy for the job in that case. <laughs> yeah, I think so. And well, and speaking of just Lovell, one of the interesting things about him throughout this book that I'm kind of uncovering or have uncovered is the moral arc that he goes through. And it's kind of the central plot line that I'm, I'm drawing from. He goes from this unassuming chemist who's working on shoes, you know, he, he's just a leather worker, to this guy who by the end of the war is basically advocating that we use biological and chemical weapons, we shell Iwo Jima with, Iwo Jima with chemical weapons. The transformation that he goes through is really incredible. So that's, that's one of the, you know, kind of plots that runs throughout this book and a really just fascinating story. Wow. That really is interesting. Of course, I'm certain that many people were transformed greatly by the years of war, but was there any particular incident or event that you're aware of that maybe led him to, to go down a darker path, so to speak? Well, to put it first, I guess, Stanley Lovell himself would say, I didn't go down a darker path. He would say, I'm doing the moral thing. He would say, using these weapons to end the war sooner rather than not using them and having the war last longer and ultimately resulting in more death is the immoral thing to do. You know, he, he would argue by using biological weapons, that's the moral thing to do because say you shoot somebody with just an ordinary machine gun or something, they're gonna, you know, get gangrene or they're gonna get a, some kind of infection, they're gonna bleed out, they're gonna die, it's gonna be a long and agonizing death. And Lovell, his argument would be, we could just use a chemical weapon and it would kill them quicker and, you know, it's more humane for them and at the same time it'll end the war quicker. Now, I don't really buy into that argument so much, but that's what he would say. Um, but I guess the main event or main thing that's, that got Lovell down this path is that Lovell had a son. He had a son named Richard who was in the military and he was, his son Richard was basically waiting to de be deployed for a land invasion of Japan. So in Lovell's mind, how am I going to save my son? Well, if we end this war sooner rather than later, that at least gives him a better chance of not being deployed to this land invasion. So that, I think that's really the main catalyst that propels Lovell down this path of we have to use whatever means necessary to end this war as soon as possible. Wow, that's, that's really fascinating. And you can, you can easily see his perspective when you put it that way, for sure. Mm -hmm. So tell me about some of the stuff that he developed or that the people under him developed. I know I'm familiar with some of it, but I'm sure there's a lot that I haven't covered yet. Yeah, there, there is just dozens and dozens of these, what they called special weapons. Some of the more famous ones probably, well, I guess maybe one of the most famous ones is called Aunt Jemima. And Aunt Jemima was basically like pancake mix. It was this flour, but it was mixed with high explosive. And so you could bake it into pancakes, you could bake it into biscuits, you could even eat it and swallow it and it would go through your digestive system and you would be okay. But at the same time, you could set a charge to it and it would explode with tremendous force. So this was an easy way to sneak explosives into foreign countries disguised as pancake mix. There are a couple funny incidents that occur with this. There's one point which Lovell is giving a demonstration to some of the Pentagon's top brass He's about to explode some Aunt Jemima to show him just how powerful it is. And one general walks over and he says, hey, can we put this on top of it? And it's just a, a plate, plate of steel armor. And Lovell says he's reluctant, but he's not going to turn down this general in front of all these other military personnel. So he says, yeah, I guess so. They put the plate of steel armor on top of the Aunt Jemima, just this flower. He tells everyone to move back. He sets the charge. The Aunt Jemima explodes and it sends this steel plate hurtling through the air. 
William Donovan is there and it goes just a few feet above his head. It almost decapitates him and it lodges itself inside a tree. Oh, wow. Afterwards, Donovan, who's, you know, kind of stoic, he's this battle hardened war veteran. He turns to Stanley Lovell and he just says, well, what's next, next on the agenda? As if nothing even happened. So, <laughs> wow. Yeah. So wow. Aunt Jemima is, you know, probably one of the, one of the crazier things they did. There are so many more of these weapons though. Another one that people are probably familiar with, especially from James Bond films or something like that, is the lethal pills, cyanide pills. That's something that was developed within this research and development branch. They would create these cyanide pills, the idea being secret agents could take these with them abroad. And while they're on their undercover missions, if they think they're about to be caught, they can basically chew on the cyanide pill and it will kill them before they can be interrogated and give up their secrets. The thing about the cyanide pill, though, <laughs> with the R&D branch, it didn't always work as advertised. There are stories of agents who bite their cyanide pill and they're agonizing in pain on the ground for, you know, 90 minutes before they actually succumb to it. Oh, the OSS kind of man, played up, oh, this pill really works, you know, really quickly. But in actuality, it doesn't seem to have done that in every occasion. And then, you know, with the cyanide pill, if you don't want to be caught with it, the good thing about it was you could swallow it. it. It could pass through your digestive system as long as you don't bite through it and release the cyanide and it would come out the other end and you could use it again, ideally after a thorough washing. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, uh, you know, just one, one of the other things that the R&D branch is developing these pills. All kinds of silent pistols and guns, machine guns. There are time pencils to delay explosions. There are incendiary devices, like I mentioned, with a bat bomb to start fires. There's all kinds of stuff. And even beyond weapons, the R&D branch is involved in creating forged documents, creating disguises for these agents, creating cover stories for them. So they're really involved in just all facets of these secret agents going abroad. From what I've read before, there were a lot of really fascinating designs that came out of the OSS, but many of them were not really useful in the field. They were sent out for testing and then they didn't really work as intended. And so they were kind of relegated to history and they're a interesting footnote for sure. But besides Aunt Jemima, what to your knowledge was maybe some of the most useful things that came out of Lovell's development? I think some of the most useful is probably the silent weapons. There's a silent 22 pistol that was used really up until the Vietnam War. So that was long lasting. The pills, of course, for secret agents, it wasn't just lethal pills, but there were knockout pills. There were pills to give energy. There were pills that you could put in a, in a bottle of alcohol and it would create a Molotov cocktail and you could throw it. So those were useful too. There were <laughs> there's just all these kind of crazy devices that were created. One of the more interesting ones, I guess, you had mentioned that some of these were created and didn't quite make it to the field. The one that just popped in, into my head is a grenade, and it was called the Beano Grenade. And the idea behind this grenade is that it was spherical, so it was easier to throw than the traditional pineapple-shaped Mills grenade. And in addition to that, it would explode on impact instead of after a certain set time. So the R&D branch creates this Beano Grenade. It explodes after a certain distance, I should say. The R&D branch creates this grenade, but as it's going through training, as it's going through detonation tests, there's one army technician who doesn't really know how it works. And so he tosses it up in the air and he, he tries to catch it. But of course, it's rigged to go off after a certain amount of distance and not after pulling the pin or whatever, or not after a certain amount of time. And so, yeah, as he catches it, it basically explodes and he ends up dying. Oh, no. And so they, they kind of put a stop to the Beano grenade because they saw it. This may be a little bit too dangerous. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Yeah. That's understandable for sure. That poor guy, though. I guess he should have gotten a better briefing before he started handling it. Yes, definitely. There's a lot of kind of crazy stories like that. And that reminds me, one of the other strange things that comes out of the R&D branch is an operation that's somewhat well known, but this is called Operation Fantasia. And this is a, an effort in psychological warfare. The idea was, it was kind of proposed that by this guy within the OSS called Ed Salinger. And his, he, had, he had been a businessman who had done import and export business in Japan. And so he knew about Japanese culture. He learned the language. And he told the OSS that in Japanese, kind of in the, the Shinto religion, there are these spirit beings, these animal beings like foxes, and they can represent portents of doom. So if you see one, it, it means bad things are coming. It's a bad omen. 
And so he decided he, he wanted to use this as a psychological weapon. If we can expose the Japanese to these fox beings, then it'll scare them into thinking that doom is coming and they might, you know, give up the war. And so this Operation Fantasia comes out of the OSS and the R&D branches in charge of kind of hosting some of the experiments that goes along with it. But it, it basically tries to capture live foxes and they paint them with radioactive paint to make them glow in the dark. And the idea is that they're going to release them in Japan. And the OSS does all kinds of experiments with this. They, you know, they drop these foxes in the middle of the ocean to see if they can swim to shore. And it's, it's just crazy. I, I wrote an arc, article about Fantasia for Smithsonian Magazine, if anyone's interested. But it'll, you know, it'll play a role in this book too. But there are yeah, all these crazy operations and experiments that come out of the R&D branch. I'm going to have to read that article for certain. This is the first <laughs> I've heard of that, and that's blowing my mind for sure. <laughs> and it, it, it's, it goes even further than that. Ed Salinger, this guy who kind of came up with this idea, one of the things that he thought of doing was also lifting one of these fox-shaped things, this glow-in-the-dark thing, on with a balloon. The idea was that people would think it's flying, and then he would hook up a sound system to it where it would project basically propaganda at the Japanese. And so you would look up, and it would be like this glowing, radioactive, fox taxidermied body flying in the air, blasting you know propaganda. It's just the craziest thing you've heard of. <laughs> John, are you sure you're not pulling my leg right now? I'm not pulling your leg. Yeah, oh, I found the gosh. document. I found the actual memorandum where he's talking about this thing. <laughs> My gosh, this this really makes me wonder what were the things that were left on the drawing board as too ridiculous? Oh, yeah, the, yeah. This what did they say? No, that would never work. Let's try something yeah, well, else. Apparently, yeah, speaking of that, there, there's a pretty good book that goes through some of these crazier schemes. It's called Nuking the Moon by Vince Houghton. It came out fairly recently. He was the previous historian at the International Spy Museum, but he talks a lot about some of these more outlandish projects. Hmm. I've heard of that one. I don't think I've, I've gotten a copy of it yet, though, but I'll have to check it out for sure. Mm -hmm. It's fascinating stuff, no question. Mm -hmm. So going back just for a moment to the, the pistol that you mentioned, I did myself, I wrote an article a little while back about the high standard pistol. And, you know, you mentioned it being in service until Vietnam. I actually found a picture of it in Afghanistan in 2001, mm. uh, which was shocking mm -hmm. because that is, what is that, around 60 years after it first entered service. And as far as I could tell anyway, that was one of the longest lived implements to come out of the OSS, but it was also probably their most effective and useful silent weapon that they developed. Is that right? Yeah, I think so. I think definitely. You know, speaking of just useful things, it's not just the weapons that were useful either. I think one of the most useful things that came out of the R&D branch was actually the forged documents and the disguises. It's fun to focus on the weapons and everything, but I really, I think the forged documents, there was a document division within the OSS, and they created fake passports, fake ration cards, fake train tickets, fake IDs for these agents abroad. And those were just as instrumental in these secret agents pulling off their operations as any of the weapons probably were, and perhaps even more instrumental because it actually allowed these agents to have a cover story where they wouldn't get picked up by the Gestapo and killed or something like that. So yeah, the documents division was really integral to a lot of these operations being pulled off. And there was also a camouflage division which in the, within the R&D branch, and that created the, the disguises for these secret agents. So it would take uniforms from German prisoners of war, so it would have authentic clothing, or even from German immigrants who had come to the U.S., it would you know, take their clothing so you would have these agents would have authentic German clothing when they went abroad for their missions. And they, they had all kinds of tips and tricks for these agents to pull off their cover story and pull off their cover identity. They would put charcoal within the wrinkles of their face so it make them look older and their wrinkles look deeper. They would stain their teeth with iodine so it made them look a little different. They would whiten the temples of their hair to make them look older. They had all kinds of tricks that they would do to change the appearance of these people. Wow. Yeah, I agree completely with what you're saying. You know, I tend to write about and research some of, you know, the weaponry in the history of espionage, but in a very real sense, the instant you have to pull a trigger, you've already failed at your mission in so many cases, right? So that's kind of a last resort in a lot of cases mm -hmm. and making your way through an area or through a mission without anybody even realizing who you are, that's far more important in so many cases. Do you happen to know where was this, where did this expertise come from? Were they hiring people out of Hollywood studios or just professional makeup artists that were brought into the intelligence community, for example? 
Yeah, there actually there actually is a, a long connection between the intelligence community and Hollywood with these you know visual effects artists w within the R and D branch, especially for the weapons. A lot of the time, they would hire scientists just from universities. So I think I had mentioned the pocket incendiaries, like the bat bombs and everything. Those were created by a man, a, a chemist at Harvard. His name was Louis Pfizer. He had invented napalm at Harvard, and Stanley Lovell caught wind of this and realized, hey, I think that would be useful for our branch. We should you know, bring this guy in. So the R&D branch basically hired Louis Pfizer just directly from Harvard. In fact, one of the funny things about Pfizer is before World War II, before anything, he'd invented napalm. And his first tests of napalm had occurred just on the Harvard soccer field. He's just in the middle of the school. He's detonating napalm bombs just to see how they explode. And there's, there's a letter from a commander of this kind of platoon at Harvard. And the commander is writing Louis Pfizer and basically saying, I can't believe you're setting off these bombs. He's not really concerned about the health of the students, but he says, you're taking up this soccer field and we need it for drill instruction. So that's why he's mad about it. <laughs> but yeah, so mostly they're, wow. they're tapping these people from universities, especially to come help with the science and technology that they're developing. Hmm. Yeah, that's a lot. Priorities have changed quite a bit since the time that letter was written, I think. Yes, I think so. <laughs> so that begs a, a question for me. A lot of these fascinating devices, I can see someone designing them, but were did the OSS, did they co-opt or contract out to different companies to develop this kind of stuff? I mean, the whole country had turned into a one you know mass production facility, I should say, geared towards the war efforts. So who did they find to develop this small stuff and, and keep it in-house and keep it quiet? Yeah, they, they definitely did contract out a lot of this stuff. S sometimes it's hard to figure out who exactly they contracted it to. I found a document within the National Archives from the OSS basically saying, we are intentionally not going to list the names of who we're contracting with because we don't want any you know anyone to associate us with them and hurt their business or anything like that. So they were intentionally vague on who they did. But in several instances, it's, you can find who was the contractor. For instance, there's a, a kind of another psychological warfare little technology, I guess, called Who Me. And Who Me was an effort in stench warfare. It was this tube that was filled with liquid that smelled extremely bad. And the idea was that you would spray it on some occupying Japanese official in China, and they would smell terrible and become embarrassed and demoralized. And this was actually contracted out to a man named Ernest Crocker. And he was at the Arthur D. Little Company. But during World War I, he had been involved in creating not only chemical weapons, he had been involved in creating smoke that smelled like chemical weapons, that smelled like gas warfare. That way you could release the smoke on the battlefield. The enemy would think that they're being hit with gas warfare and they would scatter or spread, disperse, and it wouldn't actually oh. have the bad effects of you know unleashing chemical warfare. So he had, he had been involved in this for a while. The OSS caught wind of it and it hired him to produce this, what's called Who Me, this terrible smelling liquid that would basically try to demoralize the Japanese. Wow. Do you happen to know if that was ever used effectively in the Pacific? <laughs> I, doubt, I doubt that it was. There are some documents that say X amount of units were shipped to the field, but it's really hard to get a story of whether something was actually used and when. Part of the challenge of being a historian of the intelligence community especially is that when things go right, you know, in secret warfare, you probably aren't going to hear about it. You know, it, the best operation is the one that nobody ever hears about. So that's kind of the frustration of being a historian of this period Absolutely. too. The best operations, you, you know, you might not hear about that. That's why they're good is because nobody heard about them. So it's, it's kind of the paradox of doing history. I agree. I agree completely. I don't think I've dug as deep as you have had to on your previous research trips, but it's, it's really tough to get to the heart of a matter, even decades afterwards is what I found for sure. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is. And kind of speaking of that, one of the more interesting things that happened to me just in the archives trying to do research, trying to get to the heart of matters, is that Stanley Lovell, the guy who was in charge of this R&D branch, he had written a memoir in 1963. And it, like I mentioned earlier, he was known to exaggerate. He was known to tell stories. And his memoir is no exception to that. And so it was really difficult trying to find in the archives which stories can I corroborate and which not? And I had this crazy occurrence happen to me. For my dissertation, not the thing I'm working on now, but back when I was in grad school, I had gone to the National Archives or to the National Academy of Sciences in Washington, D.C. to do some research. 
And I had taken pictures of a bunch of documents that I thought would relate to my dissertation. And, you know, fast forward to a year ago, I was going through Stanley Lovell's memoir, and he mentions this occasion where he had been called to the National Academy of Sciences to consult on biological warfare. And I didn't think much of it at the time. He also mentions in his memoir, someone else who consulted with him at the National Academy of Sciences was an, a guy named John Marcond, who's an author. He had won the Pulitzer Prize for fiction. And I just thought, this is just outlandish. There's no way that this fiction writer is consulting with the government on biological warfare and Stanley Lovell's there. He tells this kind of dramatic story. But then it happens that a few months ago, I remembered, wait, I've done research in the National Academy of Sciences and I took pictures of a lot of the documents. So I go back to my documents and lo and behold, I find the minutes of the meeting where Stanley Lovell and John Mercander are there talking about all this stuff. And I was able to basically, basically to corroborate everything Stanley Lovell says because I happened to have this document from years wow. earlier that was from the same exact meeting that Lovell was talking about. So there are some crazy coincidences that happen to you know produce some of this history. <laughs> That's fantastic. That's fantastic. It's it's all out there if you dig deep enough. In so many cases, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You That's have to know where to look, though. That's the tricky part. Yeah, I believe it. I believe it. So OSS, it sounds like they did a lot. How how big did they get during World War II? How many researchers were they employing? How many contracts were they giving? Do you have any idea? At its peak, I think the OSS was up to around 12,000 employees. That's within all the branches, you know, overseas and at home. So I think at its peak, it was up to about 12,000 employees. The R&D branch specifically never got too big because, you know, like we talked about, it would contract out a lot of these weapons, a lot of these things. And so they didn't hire in-house as many people. But yeah, I think the OSS got up to about 12,000 people. So it was, a, it was a large organization. It was an organization that kind of had some stigmas around it too. One of the stigmas that was that it just catered to society's elite. So if you were a Vanderbilt or a Morgan or a Rockefeller or something, you would get a job in the OSS. It was seen as it, one of the nicknames of the OSS was oh so social. And one of the reasons for this was because a lot of times the people who were employed by the OSS escaped deployment. They weren't deployed abroad. And so one of the jokes was that their commissions were cellophane commissions because they were see-through and they kept the draft off. So that was that was one of the jokes about the OSS. It was kind of catered to society's elite. Oh, wow. Hmm. I've heard of the Oso Social nickname before, but I had not heard about the cellophane yeah, commissions. Yeah, the cellophane, it keeps the draft off. <laughs> hmm. That makes sense. Do you think that those guys... Were they still employed in, in valuable work on the home front, so to speak? Or were they, was it also like a bureaucracy that sometimes just filled desks for no apparent reason? I actually think the OSS had a, had a hardworking reputation within itself. The OSS was pretty no nonsense. I guess maybe I should say it was not as bureaucratic as you would think for an organization so large. It really mimicked William Donovan, the leader's personality. He was someone who would cut through red tape if at all possible. He wasn't someone to wait around for a study to see if you know they should wait to do this or how they should do it. He was someone who just took action. Okay, we're going to do this. Let's go. So another joke about the OSS was that within the headquarters, it was like working in a meat grinder because everyone was always so busy. Everyone There was always commotion. There was always papers being thrown about. There was always typewriters going off. There was always people walking through the hallways. So I actually think the OSS was very productive, especially compared to other organizations that were mired down in this bureaucratic red tape. Okay. Yeah. That, that was my impression as well. And I certainly knew about the Ivy League guys getting in, but I wasn't aware that a lot of them were being kept on this side because you hear about the Ivy League guys that go overseas and do heroics, but you hear less about home front operations, administrative kind of stuff as well. Yeah. And I, th I think that has something maybe to do with People are just naturally a bit more interested in the the grand stories, the war hero who comes back or something like that. It's almost like the survivor's bias. One of the jokes is you always hear about the sailors who get picked up by a dolphin and return to shore and people think dolphins are so great, but you never hear about the dolphins who take the sailors out to sea because you never hear from the sailors again. So it might be a little bit of the survivor, bi survivor bias type thinking of the stories that we hear. Oh, I bet. I bet. So there's another outlandish story of levels that I wanted to ask you about, whether you think it's true or not. Mm -hmm. uh, I've heard about the plot to turn Hitler's gardener and give him <laughs> some chemicals. Can you expand on that a little bit? Yes. Yes. So Stanley Lovell was involved in a lot of 
either assassination plots or plots like the one you're mentioning where it would just ruin the reputation of someone. The, the one you're talking about is Stanley Lovell had mentioned, well, he had several plots to try to assassinate Hitler. He was going to try to introduce poison gas to a building that Hitler was in, and so he it would kill him that way. But this plot was that Stanley Lovell wanted to introduce female sex hormones into the vegetables that Hitler ate, and he figured he could get this, you know, these hormones into his vegetables because there was a particular place where Hitler occasionally went, the Eagle's Nest, and Lovell speculated that he must get his hormone, he, he must get his vegetables when he eats there at the Eagle's Nest from this local garden. And so he says he gave these hormones to a local gardener who was supposed to put it in the vegetables, who would then serve it to Hitler's plate. He would eat it. The idea being he would grow breasts, he would lose his mustache, and it would emasculate him. And it's just one of the crazier plots of World War II. I don't have really much corroborating evidence to go with this other than this is what Stanley Lovell said. Although I did interview Stanley Lovell's grandchildren, and several of them talked about this specific plot and said that, oh, Lovell, you know, Stanley Lovell was most proud of this one. He, he thought this was kind of the funniest one he was engaged in. So apparently, it, not just in his memoir, but elsewhere, he would tell people he was involved in this. So take that for what it is. But that was the plot, at least. But yeah, he was involved in, I know he was involved in a lot of other assassination plots, not, not just that one. So I can see how he would be involved in that one. But it also, again, it is, it is kind of silly and makes for a good story. And he liked telling a good story. Oh, absolutely. I thought that that was probably the most outlandish story I had heard about the OSS until you just mentioned Operation Fantasia a few minutes ago. Yeah. <laughs> so now there's a new champion for sure. Mm -hmm. So on the subject of those assassination plots, were any of those successful to your knowledge? Well, the OSS did assassinate, I guess assassinate would be the right word, quite a few people. When we tend to think of assassinations, we tend to think of them as high leaders, you know, the leaders of countries. The OSS was success successful in assassinating a lot of people, but I would say not really notable leaders of countries. There were a lot of plots to kill Hitler, like I mentioned. Stanley Lovell had tried to introduce that poison gas to his compound. There were other plots that Lovell was involved in to assassinate German scientists. One of the most famous German scientists at the time who stayed behind in Germany and who people were afraid was working on a German atomic bomb was Werner Heisenberg. Werner Heisenberg is, you know, famous for the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, but he was, he was a great nuclear physicist. And basically every physicist knew if Germany was trying to develop an atomic bomb, Werner Heisenberg would be the person to lead it. And so Stanley Lovell was involved in multiple different attempts to either figure out if Heisenberg was working on an atomic bomb or to kill him if they found out that he was. One of these attempts involved a colonel named Carl Eifler. Carl Eifler was the head of what was called Detachment 101. This was an OSS organization, this unit, that was sent to around Burma, the China-Burma-India theater of war. And they were, their mission was basically to, to disrupt the Japanese airfields around there, to disrupt the Japanese occupation in China. But Eifler gets called back to the United States and he gets assigned to this other mission which is to either kidnap or to kill Werner Heisenberg if the United States deems that Heisenberg is involved in creating nuclear weapons. So Lovell basically gives Carl Eifler some botulinum toxin that he can kill different people with. And he also gives Eifler cover story to go to Switzerland in Europe to capture Werner Heisenberg. So the cover story is that Eifler will allegedly be on orders to demonstrate some of the R&D branch weapons to military bases abroad. So he'll take with him these silent pistols, he'll take with him booby traps, he'll take with him these camouflage explosives. And, you know, that's his, his kind of cover story. So if anyone asks him, what's he doing? He's just saying, hey, I'm with the OSS. I'm just, you know, demonstrating these weapons. In reality, he had gone to Europe to basically kidnap Werner Heisenberg. He eventually gets called off the mission before that can happen. But the OSS assigns somebody else to try to assassinate Werner Heisenberg, and that's a baseball player named Mo Berg. His story is a little bit more famous. More people tend to know about Mo Berg, but he's this former professional baseball player wow. who gets recruited into the OSS. And Stanley Lovell also gives Mo Berg his cover story to go abroad. 
But Mo Berg's assignment is basically to go and sit in on a lecture that Werner Heisenberg gives in Switzerland. And if he deems that Werner Heisenberg is close to creating a nuclear weapon, if it seems like he's that's what he's working on, his job is to assassinate Werner Heisenberg. So Mo Berg, this former baseball player, goes to this lecture. He listens to Werner Heisenberg. Werner Heisenberg is really talking about S matrix theory, which isn't related to really an atomic bomb. Mo Berg doesn't know much physics, but he knows enough to realize that, you know, this guy's probably not doing what we think he might be doing. And so he ends up not killing Werner Heisenberg. But yeah, Mo Berg definitely has one of the more intriguing stories of World War II, but he was, you know, also Stanley Lovell had also been involved in creating his cover story for him. It's, it's funny that you mentioned Mo Berg. I just posted about him on Instagram yesterday, as a matter of fact, and mm. it's a fascinating story. I just saw that there's a 2018 movie about Mo Berg that stars Paul okay. Rudd. You've, you're probably familiar with it called The Catcher Was a Spy, but for anybody who's listening. Oh, yeah, I've, I've read that book. There's a book, The Catcher Was a Spy. Yeah, that's a good one. Yes, I haven't read it yet. I do have it on my shelf, though. There's there's always more to read, as you, you probably are familiar with that. Yeah, there's a lot of... Well, a lot of people are really interested in Moberg's story. And so he kind of, he tends to get aggrandized in a way. Like he spoke all these languages and he knew all this physics and he did all this stuff. And it's kind of like the founding fathers. I think we tend to put them on a pedestal when really they might not have even seen themselves that way. But it's, it, he definitely still has a really interesting story. He does. He was a very odd guy from everything that I've read about him. And he wasn't even that well liked in his time, from what I understand. I don't think his fellow baseball players liked him very much, and he died alone, from what I understand. He never married. He was an odd guy, but he was, I guess he was the right guy for the mission at the time when he was sent over to Europe. Yeah, he was kind of a nomad. He didn't really have a place to live. He just slept on the couches of his friends when he when they would let him. And it's ironic, he loved the world of intrigue, and so he tried to cultivate the personality of what someone would think of as a spy, which is the opposite of what any good spy does. So he, he tried to kind of make others see in him intrigue, which any good spy or any good secret agent, that's the opposite. You don't want anyone to think that you're involved in the OSS or anything, you know, the CIA. So he, he really wanted oh, to people, he wanted people to see him as some kind of spy, but that's the worst possible thing you could do when you actually are a spy. <laughs> yeah, no question about it. No question about it. I think there was an incident, and I don't know the details. Didn't he drop his pistol out of his pocket on a mission or something like that? Have you ever heard that yeah, story? Yeah, I think this is on the way to Europe. or is On the way to Europe? I, I don't remember the specific details, but yeah, he was... He was telling someone that uh, he had this cover story, and so he was telling him, yeah, I'm over here just to do, you know, whatever it is. And some pistol drops out of his out of his holster or his shirt. And, you know, the person he's talking to <laughs> kind of looks down, and they both kind of acknowledge, okay, I, I just lied to you, but we're not going to speak about this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. What a character. So there was actually, there was another story that I wanted to ask you about as well. And I've heard it said, yes, it is true, and no, it's a legend. And this one's about Donovan himself. Uh, going back to the high standard pistol that we mentioned, I th I've read that he took it into the Oval Office with FDR and he fired it into a sandbag in FDR's office while FDR was on the phone. Have you ever heard that story? Definitely, yeah. So this is, again, Stanley Lovell tells the story that William Donovan had his silent pistol and he wanted to show it off to Franklin Roosevelt. And so he goes into Roosevelt's private office. He sets a sandbag in the corner of the room. Roosevelt, who has polio, he, he was basically paralyzed from the waist down. He's sitting at his desk. He's faced away so he doesn't see Donovan. He's dictating a letter to his secretary. And meanwhile, Donovan unloads this clip of the silent pistol into the sandbag. Roosevelt suddenly smells some gunpowder and he turns around and he sees Donovan holding this gun who had just unloaded this clip into the bag. And Apparently, Roosevelt is just awestruck that he had never even heard that this pistol went off. And so Donovan goes on to say that if Roosevelt could have leapt from his chair, he would have because he was so excited. Donovan presents the weapon to Roosevelt. Roosevelt is really impressed with this silent pistol. And Roosevelt hmm. actually keeps it in his private collection at Hyde. He has a home in Hyde Park. He keeps it on display in his, in his collection. But then he's told he has to remove it from display because it's technically considered a secret weapon. And so you can't have it out. And so he, you know, he's got to kind of hide it. So do you think that's another levelism, so to speak? Or is that something that actually occurred? Franklin Roosevelt did have the silent pistol. You know, it, it was in his private collection. How he got the pistol, I'm guessing Donovan did give it to him. That's the case of... Did Donovan actually perform this thing in Roosevelt's private office? Did he actually shoot the sandbag? 
again, that's you, we've got to take, I guess, Lovell's word for the, that particular story. But I know the ending of the story is correct, that Donovan did have this pistol. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, I wonder if we'll ever know. It just it seems so odd to me to carry a sandbag into the Oval Office. That That is the part that bothers me the most about that story for some reason. But other than that, yeah, I can see it. It sounds like Donovan is, if anybody would have done that, it would have been Donovan from from my reading of him. Yeah, I think he, he was definitely someone who had the courage enough to do it, <laughs> if somebody were to. Sure. Like I mentioned, though, there have been a lot of questions about Stanley Level stories and even some things within his memoir that I'm not going to repeat in my book because there's not enough corroborating evidence. But when I do try to fact check these stories in the archives, a surprising amount of it actually does turn out to be true. So that's exciting from my perspective because, oh, wow, so some of the stuff actually is true. So it's it's fun to see. I believe it. I believe it. So what exactly happened once 1945 rolls around? Of course, we win the war. There's VE Day, there's VJ Day. And the OSS at that point only existed or a little more than three years, I believe, right? What happened at the end of the war when the when the war is over. Yeah, it didn't last that long. So Roosevelt, President Roosevelt ends up dying. Harry Truman becomes president. And Donovan had a very close connection with Franklin Roosevelt, but not so much with Truman. So their relationship was already off to somewhat of a rocky start. And then there is a, a report that comes out. This guy, Park, it's called the Park Report. He had been commissioned to create a report on the OSS and basically explain if it should continue into peacetime or not. And Park kind of had like a vendetta against the OSS. And he just, it, the report is just a hatchet job. Not all of it's even true. He makes up some stuff and mischaracterizes the OSS. Eventually this report gets to Truman and Truman thinks, oh, well, I guess we'll discontinue the OSS after World War II. And so that's what happened. The OSS is disbanded after World War II. A couple of its branches are given to other agencies. So a couple of the branches go elsewhere, but for the most part, the OSS itself in general is disbanded. And within a couple of years, Truman realizes that he does need a centralized intelligence agency. So he ends up creating the Central Intelligence Group, and this later becomes in 1947 with the National Security Act, the Central Intelligence Agency. That's So that's where the CIA kind of springs from. Okay, I see. Did Lovell have any role to play after World War II, or did he move on or move back to private practice, so to speak? Mostly he went back into business. He retired right at the end of World War II from government service. His wife and his wife's mother ended up getting sick, and so he, he took care of them. So he stepped back from government service really to take care of them. He opened his private company, the Lovell Chemical Company. He made a small fortune at the company. He developed just a range of different devices, stuff for shoes. He had worked on shoes before the war, so stuff to stiffen the toe box of shoes. And he took out a bunch of patents related to things like that. But he occasionally did still consult with the CIA after World War II. So occasionally he still did consult. And this is kind of what my book ultimately <laughs> leads to. Stanley Lovell consulting with the CIA and the long-term effects of what he did in World War II and how that influenced kind of a, a new cohort of chemists at the CIA to take up some of the similar things that Stanley Lovell had done during World War II. So he's a smaller figure, I guess, within World War II circles. He's certainly not like an Eisenhower or something like that, or a Donovan even. But Lovell actually had some really long lasting effects on the intelligence community that haven't been explored that much, but that I'm really excited to show people in this book. Good, I'm excited to read about it as well, for sure. Thank you, thank you. I am I am a little bit familiar with some of the stuff that went on, but I think that's better left for a, another discussion yeah, later on. There's a lot of interesting stuff that goes on within the CIA that Stanley Lovell is actually tangentially involved in, and that really his, his previous work influences people to start doing stuff similar to him. So it'll be a nice chapter in the book to explain how that actually happens. I bet, yeah. You mentioned a couple of things along the way, like the botulinum, and I'm like, you know what? Those showed up later on in the 60s and in the 70s, mm -hmm. and a couple of other things. So... I don't know if those are echoes, but I guess I'll have to read the book to find out for sure. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll leave you with a the teaser then. One of the main things is Stanley Lovell is experimenting with truth drugs, and that becomes a big deal within the CIA trying to find oh, yeah. something similar to what Stanley Lovell was doing. So that's kind of where it leads to. I believe it. So we've been talking all about World War II this whole time. Is there anything, if we fast forward to now, is there anything else along a similar vein that interests you that's going on right now? There are some more recent technologies that really just blow you away. It's kind of in the vein of what Stanley Level was doing, but some more recent technologies that the CIA is involved in or the intelligence community is involved in. One of them 
that I've been really interested in and trying to read about is called a laser microphone. And this is, this is actually a fairly older concept, but it is just so unbelievable that such technology exists. The idea behind this one is that say you're inside a closed room and you're talking with somebody in the room. Well, just by speaking, you're creating vibrations within the air of that room. And that those vibrations are going to affect the window in the room. It's going to be pushing on the window. And so the idea is that somebody standing outside the room can shine a laser onto the window and they could basically almost like a, a record player, almost like a record player, you know, how the needle and the groove follows and it produces the noise. Yeah. The laser that's shining onto this window will be reflected back and the vibrations in the window reflect it back in a certain way. And you can basically, you can recreate the audio that's happening in the room just by shining a laser on the window. So even if you can't hear what's actually being said, you know, this laser microphone can pick up what you said based on how the window is vibrating. So that it, it, there's crazy stuff like that happening in the intelligence community. One of the other crazy ones, speaking of, you know, just picking up signals, what's called Van Eck freaking. And this is, the, the principle behind this was actually demonstrated about 40 years ago. So it's not super new, but it's a really interesting concept. Van Eck freaking has to do with picking up electromagnetic radiation that emanates from a computer, say. So your computer is emitting light. You're seeing the light that's coming out of the computer screen, but your computer is also emitting other kinds of electromagnetic radiation that you can't see. And some of those can penetrate walls. And so the idea behind Van Eck freaking is that somebody, let's say outside the room that you're in, you can't even see them. They could pick up some of this radiation that's coming off your computer. And based on what they're picking up, they can recreate what you're seeing on your computer screen. They don't even have to see it. They just have to pick up this radiation and they can recreate your computer screen on their own one just by picking it up. So that's really a crazy concept, but it's been demonstrated. And the interesting thing about Van Eck freaking is that it's virtually undetectable. It's incredible. You, you can't detect it. Somebody's picking up the signals that you're emanating. They're not emanating a signal themselves themselves. So you can't really detect when somebody is taking your signal and, and recreating your screen. That's kind of the scary part about it. It's virtually undetectable. Hmm. Wow. That, yeah. That's the first I'm hearing of that as well. feels like there's, there's nothing secure anymore for sure. <laughs> and, yeah. And I mean, these are not new concepts. Those have been around for decades. So I'm not privy to what's going on today, you know, deep within the intelligence community, but you can rest assured that it's something much more powerful and much more technologically advanced than even these. Absolutely. Yeah. It really, it really leads you to wonder what's going on now. I mean, a lot of it, of course, is going to be online profile stuff, you know, because we are, we've given up, intentionally given up a lot of privacy and everything. So that makes it easier, I think. But it's, it's really hard to imagine how far things have come when you look at what's being declassified right now that is, you know, 50 years old, so to speak. The stuff from the early 70s that's slowly being declassified and you're amazed by that. And then you realize that it was long before you were ever born, that that was already under development. Mm -hmm. Really impressive stuff. So, hey, I really appreciate you talking to me about all of this today. Uh, what is the title of your book one more time? The title, the tentative title is The Dirty Tricks Department. Great. When is that coming out? It should be available hopefully in 2022. I'm finishing it up, so it's got to go through editing and, you know, the whole process. So it'll probably be available in sometime in 2022, but it's an exciting story. I would encourage anyone, if they're interested in any of the stories that I've talked about in any of this OSS intelligence, intelligence community stuff, to you could follow me on Twitter if you'd like, and you would be able to keep up with all the things that I'm doing. I like to post just interesting documents that I come across in the archives. So if you're interested in seeing what a historian does and some of the interesting things that they come across, feel free to follow me there. It's at John Lyle, just my name. And that's probably the best way also to figure out when this book will be coming out because I'll be posting updates there. I definitely will. I'll definitely do that. One last question for you. Is there, are there very many places that you can recommend where the, the public can go and, and read or learn more about the OSS, like museums with good OSS displays, for example? Yeah, probably the best one is the International Spy Museum. That's in Washington, D.C. They just opened a new, within the last year or two, they just opened kind of the new museum. They moved it to a new location. So that's, if you're interested in museums and the OSS and the spy technology especially, that's the one to go to is the International Spy Museum. If you are interested in reading more about this stuff, besides my book that'll be coming out, some other books that are good on topics like this is, there's one called Spycraft by Melton and Wallace. 
That's a good book that gives a general overview of the history of the technologies that are created within the OSS and CIA. I think I mentioned Nuking the Moon by Vince Houghton. He was the former historian at that International Spy Museum. He goes over a lot of the operations that had taken place within the intelligence community, some of the more outlandish ones that are exciting and fun. A good overview of intelligence during World War II, U.S. intelligence and the intelligence community is called Roosevelt's Secret War by a guy named Perisco. That, that's a good book. And also an, another book that's, it's not really about this exact topic, but I've read recently, and it's more about computers and the internet and the spread of disinformation, which is tangentially related, but it's called Like War by Singer and Brookings. Like War. So if you're interested in the weaponization of like social media and disinformation campaigns in recent times, that's a good book. Great. Thank you. I'm, I'm happy to say that I've got three of the four that you just mentioned already. Oh, great. Awesome. Uh, awesome. So I know they're good. Yeah. yeah. I haven't, <laughs> I haven't read Roosevelt's Secret War yet, but I do have it here on my bookshelf. So yeah, it's I'm, a good one. The, the writing is good too. I don't think I'm going to finish all my books before I die, unfortunately, <laughs> but I'm going to do my best for sure. Okay. Well, I really appreciate you talking to me, John. Looking forward to the book for sure. And maybe we can re-engage again right when it comes out and see if you uncovered anything else or just let people know again what it's all about, because this is one of the most fascinating topics in the world to me. And I'm going to have to go look up Fantasia right now. I, don't, <laughs> yeah. I can wait to see the book, honestly. Yeah. And yeah, thank you so much for having me. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for the content that you're putting out because it's, you know, on Instagram, your stories, your posts are really informative and I've really been enjoying them. Thank you. I appreciate it. Yeah, we'll definitely stay in touch. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks, John. Mm -hmm. So if you're interested in more Spycraft 101, look for my page on Instagram at Spycraft 101 or connect with me on Patreon. My patrons get exclusive access to long form blog posts that dive deep into some of the most amazing stories in the history of espionage and receive free or discounted books and products from the Spycraft 101 store. Thank you for listening. And I hope you'll stick around because there is lots more to come. Thanks for listening to this program brought to you by Daydreamer Network. If you enjoyed the episode, please don't forget to rate and review on Apple Podcasts or your preferred platform. Your feedback allows us to rank on the best new shows list and continue to grow our podcasts in order to bring more unique and talented storytellers to the network. To check out our shows, including programs about relationships, sports, business, nutrition, leisure, and more, head to www.daydreamernetwork.com. We look forward to seeing you back next week for another great episode. Have a wonderful day.